and welcome to our first interactive leader session of 2015. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Pat Gould, Managing Director of Marketing and Communications at the SOA. If you need technical assistance at any time today, click the live support button in the bottom left area of your screen or send an email to soa at compartners.com. You can also download the slides by clicking on the download presentation button um, on the bottom of the screen. And you can en enter a question for Craig and Arrow at any time by clicking on the Ask a Question box and typing your question in the box in the lower, uh, lower right-hand corner of the screen. I'd like to start by introducing the leaders on today's call. We have Errol Kramer, President of the SOA, and Craig Reynolds, President-Elect of the SOA. During today's session, Errol and Craig will discuss some enhancements we are planning in our communications with members and other stakeholders, highlights from the SOA research area, an update from a recent meeting of the Employers' Council, as well as upcoming PD opportunities. Finally, they will talk about the relaunch of the SOA website before moving into the Q&A portion of the webinar. And with that, I will turn it over to Errol Kramer. Uh, thanks, Pat. Um, I want to start off today with something that I feel is very important to our members and our stakeholders, and that is that uh, we uh, properly communicate what are the strategies of the society, its initiatives, um, and provide context and background. We want everyone to be as uh, knowledgeable and apprised as we are. So uh, we're going to kick off what we call a strategic vision campaign. It has two objectives. First, as I said, is we want to provide information so our members are fully apprised, as well as all other stakeholders. Um, the, uh, the second objective, though, is once we have more information out to our members, we want to hear from them on a listening tour. And uh, this is, again, our members and stakeholders because the others besides members we care about. But uh, we want to go out, and I do uh, have uh, conversations with um, a variety of clubs, and uh, they always go very well because dialogue is important. And uh, what we're really doing is teeing up information for our revised or refreshed strategic plan. Now, we have a current strategic plan that goes on through 2016, and uh, normally our next plan will be updated 2017. And in the normal series of events, we might be looking at 2016 as the uh, tee-off year. Uh, this year, we decided to accelerate it, and we have a task force that I've formed. Uh, we have some uh, very high-level people, uh, not just on the board, but leaders in the industry who can uh, help and advise us. And uh, we do want to make a very deliberative approach to understanding and setting the priorities of the uh, society of actuaries. So uh, as I said, we're going to accelerate it off, and a key input is going to be this uh, uh, listening tour. And um, uh, you know, I hope that we can uh, reach out to as many of our members as possible. So uh, uh, without uh, more ado, let me hand over to Craig, and he's going to talk of research. Thank you, Errol. I'll talk a little bit about some of the current research activities. Uh, first, work is continuing on the 2014 VBT and 2017 CSO impact study. Uh, that's a big project uh, run by Milliman, which is looking at the impact of these new tables on statutory and tax reserves, non forfeiture values, and principles-based approach reserves. Uh, we're hoping that the full variety of tables and subtable tables will be fully presented and exposed at the March NEIC meeting. We're also looking at a release of the updated study of the sing U.S. single employer pension system this week, which will look at what happens to pension contributions under different macroeconomic scenarios provided by Moody's. Next week, there will be a, a uh, presentation at the National Tornado Summit, which is an in-house development and presentation of climate research and post-catastrophe health care utilization. Climate data used to look at any anomalies of wind speed, wind direction, and soil moisture, which are indicators of catastrophic wind events. It builds off of data from the NOAA, and in combination with healthcare data collected from the state of Kansas, we look at eight specific storms from 2012 to 2013 and give insights into what healthcare actuaries and healthcare systems should be aware of when these events occur. 
We've also got an upcoming release of a pent-up healthcare demand study. It's a research report looking at utilization of healthcare systems for deferrable treatments such as knee arthroscopy, upper endoscopy, and uncomplicated dermatology following the impl implementation of the Affordable Care Act. The study leverages off data from Kansas and looks at outpatient care. Subsequent studies will expand to include preventative care and pharmaceuticals. The Geisinger Foundation is a research advisor in the initial study and will partner in the more broad follow-up work and has made a proposal to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for an in-depth analysis as principal researcher. Earlier this year, the SOA released an essay collection of predictive modeling and analytics, a field that's certainly getting more attention among actuaries and employers. These SOA papers covered life and health topics within predictive analytics. We're also planning other research projects in this field. Also, we want to point out that we're seeing ongoing references to the SOA's updated mortality tables for corporate pension plans, as many companies are reflecting the increased longevity in their pension calculations. Um, all right, thanks, Craig. Uh, what I'd like to cover now is the Employers' Council. Um, by way of explanation, we, uh, we have an invitation-only council of employers, and these are the uh, largest employers of actuaries in the uh, U.S. and Canada. Uh, around the table, representing probably the majority of, uh, of our employers. So uh, certainly a very uh, important stakeholder for the society. Uh, the uh, representatives are, by and large, the uh, most senior actuary in those organizations. And they obviously carry a lot of weight and thoughts and their uh, information advice they can give us. Um, it's always one of the uh, most uh, informative and, I think, valuable sessions we have and uh, also tends to be the most lively because we have people who have a lot of perspective and are, and are very uh, willing and eager to share that information. Uh, we meet uh, once or twice a year. It's uh, difficult to get people of that level together more frequent. Um, and we just, uh, Craig and I, just finished uh, with employers meeting yesterday, so I'll give you a quick rundown of, uh, of the outcomes. Uh, we provided an overview of uh, the Society's strategic initiative, uh, our planning uh, for next year, uh, observations of the environment, uh, a little bit of lay of the land, and much of uh, what we covered at the Employers' Council, I would like to make sure we can push down to all our members because we, we certainly got a, uh, a lot of uh, good reception from the employers. Um, the good thing is that they really highlighted no issues, concerns, or major missing. So they feel, uh, or at least I took it to be an endorsement of our uh, strategic plan and the direction we headed. Um, the, the other very encouraging item, uh, we teed off the uh, communication campaign, and uh, they were very enthusiastic about it. Uh, we received lots of invitations, in fact, almost universal. Uh, the employers want us to come into their work sites and address their uh, members, you know, our, our members, the, uh, the actual members. Um, so that will be a, a great, uh, great way for us to, uh, to make sure we have a reach into uh, uh, both uh, communicating and uh, listening to our members. Um, diversity and inclusion uh, is another topic that uh, the society, by the way, uh, uh, initiated task force. Now, there's always diversity and, uh, and inclusion uh, efforts underway in every organization. Uh, the joint uh, efforts among actual organizations, among related professions, employers. Uh, we had a lot of food for discussion, and uh, uh, employers uh, very much would like to uh, make sure that they can uh, give uh, the benefit of their own uh, uh, employer plans. Uh, give us advice and maybe coordinate as much as we can with uh, any activities the society does. The uh, task force uh, is headed by uh, Craig and it um, uh, does include a lot of members not from the society but from our sister organizations because we do want to make it more inclusive as a task force. So uh, again, uh, a, a lot of good uh, support uh, from the employers. The uh, international strategy got a lot of uh, interest. Um, they uh, 
agree with what we call our slice strategy, which is when we go outside of the U.S. and Canada, we're looking to just have a slice of the actual population there. Those that may want a uh, British, uh, I'm sorry, uh, an English, uh, could be British, it could be the U.S. Uh, fellowship, uh, that distinguishes themselves and uh, and also allows for multinationals and employers who operate across uh, many countries, um, counterparts that uh, are at the same high level of actual practice. Repeatedly we hear that the standard of actual practice among the uh, U.S. and I would say the U.K. Uh, and the derivative uh, groups, the Canadians, South African, Australians, under those systems are just uh, considered, uh, you know, so important and superior to, you know, our, our, our U.S. employers and consultants. So, uh, again, a lot of interest and, and, and some requests to go into specific countries that we might not otherwise think about, but, again, uh, we only do it to the extent <clears throat> there are people who want, uh, you know, want to be allowed with our, uh, uh, with our credential. Uh, we do have a strategy, and, uh, and, and uh, again, Craig happens to uh, be on that task force, uh, on how we reach out then and service these uh, international members that we have. Uh, up to now, we've really mainly, I think, provided uh, examination and credentialing services, but we really do want to give them a, 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 a full suite and make them feel that they are members uh, in all aspects of the society. Um, there was also discussion by the employers themselves on their employer study programs now, these study programs, really the discussion was on best practices on how to develop talent. Repeatedly we hear that what distinguishes our profession is not just our technical knowledge, which is what I call table stakes, but that we're, we are really business leaders and have business acumen. And to many, to a large extent, that information is provided in the, in the employer work, uh, workplace. So uh, it was interesting to hear what those programs are. Um, we also uh, provided results of a supply and demand for actuary study. This is a joint study with uh, the Casualty Actual Society and the Canadian Institutes of Actuaries uh, in North America. Um, we will be releasing that soon. We'll be releasing it jointly because we don't want to... Uh, uh, get a leg up on, uh, you know, because it was a joint program. But we did tee it up a little bit with employers, got a little feedback, and uh, some requests for additional statistics information that can help better position understand that data. Um, so all in all, uh, you know, very, uh, very fruitful and uh, productive meeting, and it's great. Thank you, Errol. I'll talk a little bit about some upcoming opportunities for professional development. Um, first, of course, we've got the upcoming spring meetings, uh, but there are a number of other interesting events happening, uh, perhaps the most significant of which is the Refocus Conference, which we host together with the American Council of Life Insurers. And this year, uh, a big name in the news, Jeb Bush, will be a keynote speaker at that event. You can also check the SOA's website for more information and additional professional development opportunities. Errol, I'll yield to you again. Um, all right. Well, I just want to uh, make aware, and I think hopefully most of you have already been up on the website, the society's website, uh, soa.org, and you'll see it has a new look and feel to it. Um, many of you may not even realize you're looking at a completely uh, uh, re, uh, uh, refurbished website, but um, it does have increased content relevancy. You'll see uh, it's organized by personas, you know, whether you're a member candidate or student. So the layout and uh, way information is pushed to people is based on uh, where we've identified the best needs. Um, it has uh, increased findability, uh, ability to go through and uh, find updated and expanded information, as well as the architecture behind that that supports uh, retrieval of information. And uh, it was designed to have increased usability, which is uh, more responsive to uh, the outperforms. Uh, and by the way, you know, it, it's now uh, you know, fully functional, whether it's desktop, tablet, mobile, uh, certainly a lot uh, more friendly than uh, iPad, because I now use my iPad a lot when I'm uh, traveling on the road. So uh, overall, a good refreshed look. Uh, you'll see more and more 
real people on the website. Um, I think there's a picture of myself and the uh, past president, uh, Mark Friedman. Um, more so than uh, uh, post models, uh, we find that more and more members, especially millennial, appreciate authenticity. So all in all, a, a you know, good refreshed site. Um, there's still more to come. We uh, want to increase our uh, relevancy. We want to uh, allow for geographic location, location uh, Asia, Canada, global, U.S., and a variety of other technical behind-the-scenes uh, developments. So I think this concludes our talking part. And uh, I think we, we let the q and A's at right, Pat? That's right, Earl. Thanks. Um, we will now open up the, discuss the, the discussion to your questions. I want to point out that Greg Heydrich, the Executive Director of the SOA, is also here and may answer uh, some of the questions as well or um, add additional information. And again, you can submit a question by um, putting a question in the, in the chat box and sending it over. And we'll start with a question that came in um, regarding the learning strategy. It's one of the initiatives that Errol and Craig talked with the Employers Council about yesterday, and one that we've talked about with members in, in other times. And the, the member, Errol, was asking for an update on um, the status of, of that particular initiative. Uh, all right, thanks. Well, um, I guess uh, maybe let me start by providing some context. One of our core responsibilities or, or, or values we bring as a uh, credentialing organization is our educational or learning function because it really comes down to uh, the two core things are learning and research. And by the way, when we talk of learning and this learning strategy, we are talking of the examination system. And, uh, and also, this isn't a code name for, for some type of uh, rehaul or uh, a radical change to our examination. Uh, rather, what we're looking at is um, it is a core function. It's a distinguisher. It makes us a high credential. And we want to make sure that both that our basic exam and our career-long professional development, the way we train and prepare people, um, is done on a best practices basis. What we look, what we uh, we're looking at is having both uh, uh, internal staff and members involved in uh, education at the society, as well as external um, uh, educational academia people who specialise in the science of delivering uh, education, um, and the task force. Uh, has uh, not yet formally uh, presented this report to the board, and uh, I don't have the details, but uh, but I do know that it's uh, it's due soon. And uh, part of the uh, determination of best practices is in uh, how the education is delivered. Uh, to what extent does it uh, resonate with uh, entry level, the millennials, the new generation, will it help us track people, how well do we train, how up to date are we, and also benchmark, how do we compare to other actual organizations, how do we compare to other institutions, other professions. So uh, um, looking forward to that getting wrapped up, and I think that will be a core uh, function of the society that uh, you, uh, any organization has to look at. Uh, at what its key strategic uh, strengths are and make sure we're, we always maintain best in class uh, quality. Thanks, Errol. Craig, one of the areas that Errol discussed when he was providing that update from the Employers Council meeting was um, discussing various initiatives, including the international strategy. And I know you, you are a member of the, the task force that is overseeing the, uh, the development and execution of that strategy. I wonder if you can add a little more information to, to what Errol talked about in terms of where, where the SOA is looking in terms of an international growth strategy. Thanks, Pat. I'd be happy to talk about that. Um, International growth and development is one of the key strategic initiatives of the SOA, and that's true for a number of reasons. One is that approximately 22% of our candidates are outside the U.S. and Canada, and we have an obligation to, to serve the needs and interests of those members. Um, secondly, uh, we believe that to create the greatest opportunity for some of our members, 
many of whom will work for companies that are owned internationally or may move outside the U.S. themselves, the SOA needs to have a, a footprint outside the U.S. in order for our credential to be recognized outside the U.S. and thereby serve everyone involved. If you were to go back and look at the uh, strategy map, which underlies many of the decisions and actions the SOA takes, there are really uh, at least three key portions of that map that refer to international growth. One is to uh, state a goal of growing membership in selected regions, one to build actuarial communities, and one to foster partnerships with other international actuarial organizations. And with our international international strategy, we'll be working towards all of those things. That's come up most recently in a, a couple of key areas. One is in mainland China. We're working on formalizing and finalizing our China strategy. Uh, it's recognition of the fact that China is becoming a, a much larger and more significant insurance market, and therefore a much larger and more significant market for actuaries. Um, our, our China strategy will have a couple of different tactics associated with it, generally involving looking for ways to form a, form win-win partnerships with the Chinese Actuarial Association, provide some tailored services to the stakeholders we have in that market, and of course, as always, for everything we do, to promote and protect the, the brand, the SOA credential. Um, we'll also be looking at adding staff in mainland China. Um, meanwhile, we're looking elsewhere in the world at other opportunities for the SOA to uh, continue its influence outside the U.S., um, in particular in Latin America, which we view as a good market for us. Um, we'll be looking down there with three primary tactics. One is to uh, uh, form and, in and improve relationships with regulators to provide the support we can to the regulators in Latin America, uh, to provide professional development and continuing education opportunities for our members in Latin America as well as other actuaries that are not part of the SOA. And finally, to uh, improve relationships with universities through providing actuarial education in Latin America. Uh, two of the bigger actuarial markets down there, uh, Argentina and Brazil, uh, have a, a university education-based system rather than an examination-based system, and continuing to improve those relationships will be uh, very key to having relationships with the actuarial practice in those markets. Great. Carol, this discussion of various strategic initiatives, and, and you, you mentioned the update of the SOA strategic plan. We did receive some questions uh, asking about how often our strategic goals, our strategic initiatives are reviewed. Can you talk about that? Uh, sure, Pat. Uh, hopefully without being too repetitive, I, I did cover this under the strategic vision that we're going out to uh, get some input and that we're kicking off a uh, early start to uh, to the next strategic plan and uh, we'd also had some discussions with the employer council and we've also had some discussions on this with uh, other partner organizations like the UK Institute and Faculty. We were out there at the board meeting in Edinburgh. Um, the, but in general, when you're looking at a strategic plan, they uh, tend to run three to five years. Now, our current one happens to be four years. I think some others have been longer or shorter. Uh, an organization never really knows what external factors may come about that change uh, or, or outdate or, or have a required refreshing. Um, certainly, a lot of things have been developing among the society and the organization in general and supply and demand for actuaries, et cetera. So, um, so I've decided, uh, and others as well, that uh, you know we really should have a, a good in-depth look and make sure we feel comfortable uh, with our strategic plan or other ways we can tweak it and all that. So uh, probably if we stay on schedule, we will do a deep dive in 2015 and then tee up the specifics and recommendations well thought through in 2016, give ourselves time to go back to members and stakeholders uh, if there are fundamental big issues, um, uh, 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 put it out there and maybe get some uh, comment and feedback. And then the board ultimately makes the decision. So uh, that's a long, uh, long-winded long way, I guess, of saying that uh, uh, the current strategic plan will end 2016 and the new one will start 2017. It will either be three, four, five years based on uh, what the board decides at that time. Uh, thanks, Pat. Thank you, Errol. 
Craig, we've had a request for um, an update on the general insurance track. Can you talk a bit about that? Absolutely. Um, in general, we're very pleased with the way the general insurance track development is going. Um, it's a, a young track, just recently implemented with the first exams offered just a little bit over a year ago. So as one would expect, it will take a while to get uh, you know, the, the volume of candidates in that track that, that we might hope for in the long term, but we're very satisfied with the number of signups so far. Um, we have a full pathway in place for examination and validation in the general insurance track, including the development of new textbooks ex and a full set of exams. Um, it's quite possible we'll have our first fellow in the general insurance track sometime during 2015, which obviously will be a very significant milestone for us. Um, meanwhile, we're working on some of the other things that go along with providing a, a track. One is uh, working on professional development sessions at some of our meetings, and we hope to later this year have at least two research projects on general insurance related topics. Um, meanwhile, some of the uh, uh, we have to continue with some of the externally focused aspects of this track, and one is making sure that it receives appropriate uh, recognition from other organizations and governmental entities. Um, the UK Institute and Faculty of Actuaries has recently completed a review of our general insurance track where they benchmarked it against their own exams and their own educational materials, and they fully signed off as saying that they, they feel it is a very high-quality track that they will recognize. That was a very significant milestone for us. Um, the CIA, the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, is also in the process of reviewing the track and making sure that it has appropriate Canadian content. Uh, we're very optimistic that that review will go through as well. Uh, meanwhile, we're working on uh, the various uh, regulatory agencies in the academy. Uh, we're hoping to get adoption or reflection of, of the recognition of our track in the U.S. qualification standards and also from the NAIC as well as recognition from other countries on how they, that they will recognize our track as well. Um, we're encouraging the NAIC to seek an independent evaluation of the quality of our track so that they don't need to rely on uh, CAS members to evaluate our track. We'll get this, hopefully, hopefully they'll do this outside examination, and if they do, we're quite confident that they will conclude that the quality of the track is every bit as rigorous and as high quality as all of the other tracks we offer. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Uh, a related question, and, and Greg, I'm going to turn to you um, uh, for this one, if you don't mind. Question on when we expect the first uh, GI fellows, FSAs, um, to, to come through, and how we're hoping to have them involved uh, with the SOA. Well, I think uh, Craig touched on that and indicated we expect them in uh, in 2015. And and uh, just uh, given uh, given the progress of some of the candidates uh, through, we do expect uh, the first uh, couple of them to come through uh, through uh, this year. So uh, that'll be a big moment for us, obviously, and we're very pleased uh, to see that. Overall, I think we've got something on the order of about 100 people who've touched the system through registering for one of the exams or modules or so forth that are beginning to work their way through the different uh, aspects. Um, like any other fellows, any other FSAs, we'd like for them to be uh, to be uh, come involved in volunteering for the society when they attend their uh, fellowship admissions course. They'll certainly hear about volunteer opportunities in the in the uh, education system, um, in, in the sections, or in research, wherever their interests are. I think there's a huge benefit to members and, of course, uh, to the society from uh, uh, new fellows uh, volunteering. And we would hope they would engage in all of the same ways that, uh, uh, that uh, we, we see other new fellows uh, engaging with the society. Thanks, Greg. Errol, this idea of volunteerism has, has come up in some other ways. And, and the question that came in was kind of a more general one of um, whether we, we feel that we have a good number of volunteers, if we're looking to increase them, and if we're, we're evolving on our, in our thoughts on, on volunteerism. Uh, well, Pat, yes, we are a volunteer-driven organization. If you look at how we administer our examination system, uh, it's at a fractional cost of what a college professional qualification would be. And if you look at the amount of research we do, we probably uh, overwhelm the aggregate of all the research done in all the other actual organizations in the world. We... Uh, we only have so much we collect from uh, exam fees and from uh, memberships. So uh, volunteerism uh, is important. 
is important for for the uh, functioning of the society. But but also, I think the importance of volunteerism is it's probably about the best way for someone to get professional development. Uh, you know, I've always been a volunteer. You know, that's how I ended up as president of the society, and I've always chaired other organizations. It's not to fill a seat or be an empty suit. It's because when you volunteer, you learn a lot, and you're forced to uh, um, to do things that may be outside of your normal mainstream. Now, the important thing with volunteerism is to get people involved early on. So we've had uh, strategies, and Gregor touched on some of that, of how can we encourage people at the very earliest stages, give them sort of micro-volunteer opportunity, things like that. Um, and uh, uh, that's basically the best way is when you're sort of uh, young in your career, you grow on that, and, uh, and then you, you get to appreciate uh, the growth in the two-way learning. Thanks, Errol. We had a member notice that the LPC conference is not listed on the SOA's website as, as a continuing education opportunity. Greg, can you explain why that would be? Sure. Um, uh, hopefully I can take care of this one uh, pretty quickly. Uh, the Long-Term Care Industry Conference uh, is a major opportunity for SOA members and others uh, involved in the long-term care field to earn continuing education. For a number of years, though, it has been operated by an independent uh, organization, the ILTCI Conference uh, uh, Organization. So it's not, strictly speaking, an SOA event. Um, or it, I'm not sure it's even formally sponsored by us. So th that's why it wouldn't necessarily be listed there, but, uh, but we absolutely encourage members uh, to attend it. We want members to attend it. It is uh, certainly the biggest and probably the best conference in that uh, field. Um, I know our long-term care section is, uh, is exhibiting uh, at the conference, and they'll be, uh, they'll, you know, m many members will be presenting and so forth. Uh, one of the features of it as well is that it uh, draws people from well outside the uh, actuarial profession who are involved in that field and gives our members attending an opportunity to uh, to interact uh, directly with uh, other uh, other people involved in that field. So I'd encourage uh, any members who are working in that area to attend, um, And uh, uh, but that's uh, the strict uh, answer to the question. Great, thanks. Errol, in the, the presentation earlier, Craig discussed the impact of, of some of the research that the SOA does and, and touched on uh, the, uh, the updated mortality tables, which were released late last year. wondered if you had anything you wanted to add in terms of impact of SOA research. Um, well, impact for SOA research, uh, we uh, do uh, obviously do a lot of experience studies, but there's one that uh, I'd say is fundamentally different than other experience studies, and that's the uh, uh, the pension uh, table, uh, the RP 2014. Um, put it in context, uh, uh, the pension, industry pension tables are meant to be baselines that, that uh, pension practitioners would, would then work on in terms of uh, customizing for the demographics of this specific plan. So it's just a baseline, and then you look at uh, data. Reality, what happens with, uh, with the uh, RP2000 table, uh, it defines really a safe harbor that all pension plans would use for whether it's tax purposes or funding or whatever. And uh, if you look at the trillions of dollars of money that are on pension plans in the U.S., any change to that baseline has enormous impact. So when we introduced our RP 2014 table, uh, we hear of numbers of 6% increase in liabilities and trillions of dollars. I mean, that's enormous. But the work we do, we have to understand, has uh, enormous societal ramifications. It impacts uh, companies that are closing off pension plans and may want to uh, close out or sell off their liabilities. It impacts how people get lump sum distributions from plans. So uh, we, we always have to be very deliberate. Now, what we found with the 2014 table is that it took us 14 years to come out with a new table. And there is always a natural inclination 
because of the enormous impact for everyone to feel, well, not quite yet, let's delay. We did a lot of research, a lot of peer review, um, and uh, we realized that uh, we really had to release the table, which we did. But we did still listen to a lot of uh, the stakeholders, and, uh, and we did another peer review. And uh, again, we, we felt satisfied. We made a little you know, concessions and changes. Um, but certainly when it came out, you started hearing some very big numbers. AT&T, for example, disclosed $8 billion change in liability as a result of that table. Um, in any case, so what are the learnings? You know, when we provide things that, that are what I call in the interest of societal research or that serves a public, uh, you know, a public need, um, the first thing is that 14 years clearly is unacceptable for something that important. Uh, we're now going to commit that it's not going to be longer than six years, and uh, I and others would like to see it maybe be three years, but certainly we're not going to wait that long uh, going forward. Um, the second thing is we know that data is important, and we, we actually have more data for this study than we've ever had. But we also have a lot of data that we didn't use because it wasn't up to our pristine standards. And uh, our research area of the society has been working with the providers of data, PBGC being one of the big ones, uh, and they've been very cooperative of, well, why don't we just get the data improved and use uh, 100% or close to 100%. And that, that could almost double. I mean, it's a substantial improvement. You know, as actually we, we need to use as much data as we can. Um, I guess the, uh, um, the third learning would be um, the science of how we project mortality has increased dramatically and requires more of a cohort than a uh, linear calendar year duration or approach. And uh, those changes were implemented, but there is a need for technology to catch up and systems, whatever. And you know what? It's okay if someone uses a more simplified method for now, but we need to move in the right direction. So we presented the, uh, the MP uh, 2014 as a state of the art and then other simplifying approaches, at least moving in the right direction. Uh, just a final comment I'd say is that uh, uh, the learning continues. Um, we have a longevity uh, seminar that's, I think, next week. And uh, we have practitioners now uh, uh, actively working and debating on uh, how best to improve our, you know, the way in which we, uh, we model and manage uh, pension plans, not just mortality, but a lot of behavior and other aspects. So uh, certainly, I think a very good example of uh, how uh, you know we, we do very impactful research. Thanks, Errol. We've had uh, questions from a few members about the relationship of the SOA and the CAS. Errol, can you talk a little bit about how the how the two organizations are working together? Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, well, I, I guess the uh, first thing is we have to acknowledge that uh, we are now in competition because of our general insurance track, and uh, that's the core of what the uh, Casualty Actual Society is. Uh, but that said, we, uh, we also have to understand that we can have very collegial, fair, and constructive competition. Um, we, uh, we compete with the UK for members internationally outside of the US, and we work very closely with them. And now we will be competing with the CAS for some members in the US. Uh, you, you know, I like it to sort of the, uh, the, you know, Harvard versus Stanford, where each one wants to get the best professors and students, but they're both very good, fun organizations. Now, now in my personal relationship, I work for Allstate, which is a multi-line, and uh, there are many, mostly uh, casualty actuaries, and a lot of us life actuaries as well. On a professional basis, there's nothing but respect. I mean, we all recognize ourselves as highly trained professionals. Um, we know we're in uh, different specialties, but that's no different than, uh, you know, I'm a life actuary versus a pension versus a health actuary. We, we sort of respect and understand we're all part of what is concerned, what the public and regulators players see us as one singular U.S. actual profession. So uh, I think it's very important that we maintain good relationships, 
In terms of uh, volume, if we look at uh, the size, the society is the world's largest. If you're looking at, mem at the total world membership, the, uh, you know, the International Actual Association, IAA, uh, we're, we're probably around 40%. And I, don't quote me on these, but uh, you know, I think that's sort of close enough as a ballpark. Uh, we're probably double the size of the UK Institute and Faculty, which is 20%, and the casualty is about half of that of, of the UK, or about 10. So if you add that up between uh, the US, the UK, and the casualty, and I think these are what I would consider the three high credentials, distinguishing from what uh, Craig had talked of, university-based, as opposed to a profession, which is a post-university uh, post uh, education. Uh, we're the majority of what the world sees in actual profession. And certainly in the U.S., no one, no one cares or makes distinctions about qualifications. We know it. The public sees us as actuary, and we have all good reputations. So it's important that we maintain good relationships and we all work together on a, uh, on a common value of the actual brand. Now, uh, surprisingly, but hopefully it shouldn't be surprising, but there are very good professional relationships that we have with the CAS and with its members. Uh, the education, uh, uh, we sort of with the same students, same gene pool. Everyone takes uh, the exams. We administer it, but it's a common exam, same scoring, it's blind to who, who's taking our basic level exams. And then they branch off. You either do the casualty or you do the society specialty tracks. Um, uh, if you look at, uh, we both offer the CRA designation, and that's fine, it's just a choice. Uh, so in theory, we've always been in competition along that track. The, uh, uh, the joint uh, ERM symposium, I mean, we, we've uh, revalidated that there's a lot of interest, both sides, that we, uh, we maintain this as a joint because, uh, you know, we have a very common uh, set of... Uh, of skills and research and learning that we want to do in terms of enterprise risk management. Uh, Craig mentioned the Actuaries Climate Index, which I think is a great piece of, uh, uh, of, 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 of a great study, and I think it's going to actually could potentially give us a lot of press. It just hits a, a, a resonates with the public, again, in terms of the brand and uh, the public seeing us as a profession. So. Uh, so yes, uh, we are in competition. We need to sort out a little bit of the issues of organizational relationships. But certainly we're fully committed, and I believe it's mutual from the CAS, to having a joint high uh, level of cooperation wherever we can and maintain the uh, actual brand in the U.S. Errol, if it's okay, I'll, I'll jump in and make a couple of additional comments. Um, First, I just want to reiterate perhaps the most important point you made is that the SOA leadership and board has immense respect for the CAS. They're one of the premier actuarial organizations in the world. Um, they, have, they produce uh, a very highly qualified actuaries and have a very highly valued credential, as do we. Um, as such, we're very happy to work with them almost any time, anywhere, on just about anything. And uh, your, your Harvard-Stanford analogy which I would probably be biased to refer to as Harvard and MIT instead of Harvard Stanford, but I, I generally would buy into it other than that, the idea that we can work together on areas of mutual interest, be it research, uh, continuing education, professional development, or, or any, any related topic. Um, the climate change work and the supply and demand studies are great, great examples of that where we've done good work. Also, I've been involved recently with the Joint Committee on Career Encouragement and Diversity, which is a committee between the, that has both CAS and SOA members working on an inter, a, a topic that is of value to the entire profession, and that is diversity in the profession. I, I believe that as the larger organization of the two, we have a special burden and responsibility to do what we can to raise the prestige of the, organ, of the actuarial profession in a big picture sense that includes actuaries in all practice areas, and that's what we're working towards. also want to point out that we do have ongoing uh, uh, communication and interaction and cooperation with the CAS and other actuarial organizations through a, a few uh, third-party organizations. The North American Actuarial Council, which is an association of all the actuarial organizations in the U.S., uh, Canada, and Mexico. The Council of U.S. Presidents, and of course, uh, along with many other organizations, through the International Actuarial Association. Thanks, Craig. 
We also had a question, Errol, about the SOA's relationship with the American Academy of Actuaries. Uh, sure, Pat, but first I want to uh, get back to Craig on his issue about MIT and Harvard. The reason I brought up Harvard and Stanford is my daughter had to choose between the two, and she chose Stanford. It had nothing to do with the professional standards, the academics, and who was better. It had to do with the weather. <laughs> so that gives an indication of how people truly make decisions. Uh, but anyway, sorry not to digress too much. And by the way, they both cost the same, which is a loss. So if you haven't started saving for college education, please do so. Um, all right, back to uh, back to uh, the academy. The uh, again, it's like this: uh, the CAS. Uh, we absolutely have to have good relationships with the academy. Um, the academy is a little different because what the academy does is they handle the public policy matters for the profession, and they, they're good at it. They experience that's the expertise. They're in DC. They have the relationships, and it's very valuable for the profession that we have this. Uh, facing uh, organization, and that's what I specialize on. I've actually served on many academy uh, committees in the past, chaired the law financial reporting, the annuity, and a lot of other stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of all the good work that the academy does and what our volunteers do. And uh, certainly I want to make sure we have normalized relations with the academy. Again, maybe it's something that's a challenge we have to work on. Uh, but in any case, so what we're doing is looking for opportunities where we can uh, do uh, joint research, collaborative efforts. Uh, whenever we do something that uh, has some societal impact, for example, I mentioned the RP 2014 table, but there are many other examples such as uh, uh, claim costs under the Affordable Care Act, etc. Uh, we always uh, cheer up with the Academy, make sure they're prized hope and invite that they will uh, support us. And there may be reasons sometimes they cannot. Uh, we respect that, but mostly uh, we can work cooperatively. Uh, we have a similar relationship with the Canadian Institute of, Institute of Actuaries. And, uh, you know, we're working through, uh, you know, a memorandum of understanding and uh, um, uh, cementing those good relationships. So anyway, bottom line is, uh, as for the CAS and the Academy in the U.S., uh, absolutely, uh, you know, we uh, we want nothing but corpus of uh, uh, relationships, and we'll work at that. Thanks, Errol. And one final question that came in regarding the GI track. Wondering what the value of the GI track is to the other FSA tracks. Put another way, why is it why is this important for an FSA in in another track? And Greg, I think maybe you have some thoughts on that if you'd like to address that. Sure, I'll, I'll uh, give a couple of comments, and uh, Craig or Errol may want to jump in. Um, just uh, one thing I'd note is as an educational philosophy at the SOA for many years, uh, we well, we, we believe areas of actual practice are highly related uh, one to the other, and we've believed that and built that into our education system for many, many years. Uh, we've had some uh, general insurance material in our educational system uh, probably for a decade or more, uh, probably longer than that, uh, based on this philosophy that all actuaries ought to know some things about all different uh, areas of actuarial practice. Um, I think as we go forward, there will be lots of interrelationships between uh, general insurance and areas like certainly like uh, health insurance. Um, Craig mentioned earlier that we've got some research uh, that Dale Hall will be uh, presenting, I think, uh, next week, uh, that looks at health experience, uh, uh, health experience in Kansas in, in a time of catastrophic storms. So uh, there are going to, going to be those kinds of relationships. There are going to be clear relationships with enterprise risk management uh, practice, which uh, taking the, the very first name in that enterprise, uh, enterprise-wide. Uh, suggests that an organization that's taking an ERM approach is going to have to think about its property exposures, its liability exposures, its health exposures, its life exposures, and so forth. So I think there will be some interrelationships there. Um, and of course, uh, the emerging field of predictive modeling, um, you know, when I get together with, uh, with uh, actuarial groups, uh, I often hear uh, asserted that uh, the property casualty profession in general uh, has adopted techniques of predictive modeling uh, much earlier than uh, than other areas of actual practice, and I think there will be uh, interrelationships there. You know, our sense is that uh, when actuaries are broadly trained about uh, all areas of actual practice, they're better able and better prepared 
uh, to handle the variety of issues that are going to come uh, come to them uh, in the course of their career. So, you know, we're certainly we believe there will be many of those uh, flowback benefits from the GI track to uh, the other areas of actual practice, and and uh, we look to see those uh, in the future. I don't know if Craig or Errol want to add uh, to that, but. I generally agree with everything you said, Greg. I'll, I'll just add that um, the U.S. practice of segregating general insurance actuaries from, from life and health and pension actuaries is, is unique to the U.S., and this is an issue that's closely related to our international strategy where outside the U.S., generally speaking, an actuary is an actuary. And there are, when, when I deal with my clients internationally, they're very puzzled by actuaries that say, well, you've got to talk to somebody else about that. They're a part of a different organization. Um, that, that's a hard structure to understand. And anything we can do to provide a single source, complete curriculum, even though someone would, of course, have to be cognizant of the, the U.S. qualification standards about their ability to practice, we do at least be able to say, yeah, there, there are people in our group that deal with that. And I, I think that's a lot easier for the rest of the world to understand. Uh, I, I would just second what... Uh Craig said, and again, working for a, a, a multi-line where you have casualty and the life actuaries, and there's a lot of commonality. You know, if someone gets injured in a car accident or they get disabled through some other source, uh, you know, and you, there, there's just lots of blurry lines. And uh, fundamentally, within my company, we make a very, we've made a very big strategic change where we're going to bring put the life and the casualty right together, the actuaries and all that, in terms of product design. Because we really see that it's a, uh, a complementary, you know, you service the insurance needs of a customer, and they're no longer going to be too distinct across the, uh, across the road, literally two big uh, buildings across the road from each other. Um, uh, I think from uh, the way business was going, and, and, and again, Craig just says it's unique. You know, coming from a South African background, it just sort of amazed me when I came to America. It was a separate profession. It doesn't exist elsewhere. And, and, and it's always a surprise, often a surprise to people outside of the U.S. In fact, when you cross the border to Canada, there is no distinction. It's a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, although by and large some of them may be picking up the practice of how they qualify. Uh, but in any case, it is what it is. Uh, you know, there, there'll be two credentials, uh, but we can't be we can't be the eighty percent solution uh, actuary because we've got to have the full gamut of uh, knowledge education within what we consider to be the state of the art. So, if a health actuary needs to know about predictive modelling, you can't say, "Well, you're a lesser predictive modelling because you don't have all the insight that uh, you might have done on the uh, your insurance track in terms of uh, analysing behavioural aspects." Uh, but anyway, so that was not too much on my high horse, but um, I, uh, you know, acknowledge that there, there could be competition. That's okay. You get a choice. But that there's no need why we don't have a comprehensive uh, curriculum like the rest of the world. Thanks, Errol. One final question. The, there was a, a survey that was sent to um, some members last summer regarding uh, kind of a para-actuary um, idea that the SOA had, had started to look into, and this member was asking for an update on that project. Uh, sure. First, a few little quick uh, updates on the background. Not everyone may be aware of it, but the uh, UK Institute and Faculty of Actuaries came, up, came out with uh, what they have labeled a, uh, the Certified Actuarial Analyst, uh, CAA designation now. To us, it looks like it's a diploma. It's essentially a two-year study course. Now, some of those courses look like they're related to the same as our actual syllabus, but again, they taught at a much lower level. And uh, uh, really, the expectation is uh, you do the study material, take a test, and you pass. And, and, and you say, for a couple of years, you get a little flavor of what it is to be an actuary. And uh, then you have a year uh, work diploma, a work experience, and you get your diploma. And uh, they make them a certain non-voting class, I think, of their general members. We we didn't exactly warm to the idea, but we felt that uh, there were some, uh, you know, important attributes in that type of program. And uh, the UK is being very forthright. They don't see this as a. Uh, they see this more as an accommodation to uh, finding, helping find employment for what we might call para-actuaries. And they've had a reasonable response. So we've been monitoring uh, 
you know, how the program's been working on their part. Um, and, and it really, really goes after uh, two categories of people. One is, um, as I said, uh, the, the person who doesn't have the wherewithal in terms of resources or desire to go through a rigorous actual training, but want to do some type of support, whether it's uh, compliance, working in IT, where you support the actual functions, etc. And uh, the second is for uh, uh, countries where the UK is uh, very uh, active in, uh, for example, India and uh, English-speaking Africa, where uh, their needs are very modest and they need to get people trained and quick, uh, at least in the basics of insurance principles. So, so we're still, uh, basically we're still at the stage of mulling it over and saying, where does that fit within our strategic plan? Task Force has not yet come to a final recommendation. Uh, we may or may not offer an equivalent qualification, but um, we're still in the inquiry stage. And again, the response we got from members and from employers uh, was lukewarm and probably what the uh, UK got, I'm guessing. You know, some members are for it and most are neutral to it. So, so that's where it sits. Um, if we do, we'll make it very clear that we're going to distance it and not try and integrate it with natural profession. We think that will create confusion. And so all our efforts will be to make sure if it is there, it is a separated in some or another way in terms of the branding from, uh, from what we call an actuary. And I think that the task force is due to wrap up sometime this year. So, uh, again, that will be part of the input that goes into our strategic planning process. Just one quick thing I wanted to add, which is that I think that the certified actuarial analyst or para-actuary, whatever term you choose to use, really already exists in most or many or most companies, I think, just without that title. There are many cases where people have learned on the job or perhaps by taking some of the early actuarial exams and stopping and have decided never to become qualified as an actuary, but are functioning in a pseudo-actuarial role. All we're doing here is considering a process for formally credentialing people that are in that role right now, which has a number of advantages. One is it provides opportunity for people functioning in those roles to get certification and recognition, but perhaps more significantly, it brings them under the, could or could be structured to make them subject to qualification standards for professionalism, and that's something that I think benefits all of us if we can see that happen. Great. Thanks so much, Errol. Thanks so much, Craig. We have come to the end of uh, the time for this session today. We'd like to thank all of our members for participating in this webinar and would ask if you can hold on to complete a very short evaluation survey that will be coming up. Uh, we really welcome your comments and feedback as we continue to find ways to improve these sorts of communications with our members. Thanks so much, and have a great day, everyone.